Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Man, what a great set from the band. That was great. Wow. So, so good. Merry Christmas to you. It's hard to believe we are in December. It seems like we were just in the summer, and here we are. Wow. That went really quick. Hey, welcome to part four of our series, Before You Walk Away for Good. If you have not been with us over the last few weeks, I highly encourage you to go by, please, our website, fplive.org. Org, and you can check out parts one, two, and three of the series, because I can almost guarantee you, if you are just joining us today for the first time, if this is just kind of your beginning in this series, you're going to walk out of here with a lot of questions. You're going to go, yeah, but what about this, and what about that, and I don't understand what he meant by this or this. So each week is kind of building on each other, and we've given some foundation uh, to today's message in the past three messages. I'll try to review a little bit here today to catch you up. But if you get a chance to go by the website and listen to them, go to our YouTube channel and hear them all there for free, and you can check it out, okay? So hopefully you've also got a phone or an iPad or something, you're using the app, and you can follow along in the scriptures that we're going to be getting into today, and take some notes in there as well. All right, why are we doing this series? Because here's the reason, this is the, the, the biggest reason that we've decided to take time out and take a look at, at, at before you walk away for good. Here, here it is. People like you, too many people like you and me, and especially our young adult kids, are walking away from the church, walking away from God, walking away from Christianity, and that breaks our hearts. Just because you have doubts, you have not settled. Mysteries you haven't solved doesn't mean you need to walk away from everything. But a lot of people don't know that. So they struggle with a particular doubt or there's a mystery that they can't solve and it's like, well, since I don't understand this about God or I don't understand that about Christianity or there's something here in the Bible that I don't believe or I don't understand, I guess I just got to walk away from the whole thing. And they're putting their Bible on the shelf or they're throwing their trash can, they're checking out a church and they're not coming back. But here's the problem with that. When you leave all things God, the alternative isn't what it's cut out to be. When a person or society abandons God, They toss purpose, meaning, love, and morality to the wind. So leaving God creates a lot of problems in and of itself. So we got a dilemma. On one side, we've got doubts. On the other side, we've got despair. Now that doesn't mean every Christian struggles with extreme paralyzing doubt, nor does it mean every atheist struggles with and battles despair. You may be a happy Christian today. And you're going, I don't even know what you're talking about, Scott. I don't even battle the things you're talking about. You may be a happy atheist going, I don't even struggle with despair. And that's fine. But many Christians struggle with doubts. If you don't, you should. You're not thinking enough. Okay? And every atheist battles despair. If you're, if you're not, you're not thinking enough. Okay? So I, I guarantee you, if you really put your mind in this thing, you're going to struggle with some doubts and you're going to struggle with some despair. And I don't want anybody stuck in between. It's okay to go there. It's even healthy to go there sometimes. It's healthy to stretch out some things. It's healthy to go, wait a minute, what about this? Or I don't understand that. That's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. If you read and study and apply your mind, you're going to struggle with some doubts. You're going to have some questions. You're going to come up against some mysteries. You're going to wonder about some things, and that's okay. But I don't want you to stay there. I don't want you to get paralyzed in the middle. So that's what this series is about. It's for those who are stuck in the middle between doubt and despair, in the middle between theism and atheism, and for those especially those who have either uh, thrown their hands up and said, you know what, I don't want any of this Christianity stuff. I don't want anything to do with God. I don't want anything to do with church. You're here today, and it's possible you're here. You feel that way, but you're here because you want your kids to grow up in some kind of moral environment. So you've dropped your kids off over there, so hopefully we can you know, put some good things in them, and they'll kind of be more honest than dishonest, a little bit more kind than mean. And you know, it's always good to have that kind of foundation, that grounding. But you yourself, you're, you're not really a spiritual person. You're not really a God person. For whatever reason, you, you've, you've lost your interest in God. He has lost his appeal to you. Christianity doesn't seem tenable to you anymore. Or you are a person who's thinking about that. You've kind of done the church thing for a long time. You've read the Bible. You, you, you've given it your best. But it's just not cutting it. And you're thinking, you know what? At the end of this year or maybe over the next few months, I think I might just check out. I might just quit the whole thing. And if that's you... Man, this series is why we're doing it. 
Because if you are one who's walked away or you're thinking about walking away, we want to give you an opportunity to come back. We want to give you an opportunity to rethink a few things. And here's what we've said over the last few weeks. Here's the review, okay? A few weeks ago, we said, when people walk away from Christianity, they typically walk away from a version of Christianity, okay? Trust me, there is not Christianity, There's a version here, there's a version here, there's a version here, there's a version here. There's all kinds of different ones. And most of the time, when people walk away, they've walked away from a particular version of Christianity. And it comes down to about two main kinds. One is the somebody told me so God. And the Bible told me so Jesus. Somebody told me. My mama told me God, my, 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 my daddy told me God, my, my pastor told me God, and you adopted that belief about God, and you've been following that somebody told me so God, and now it's not working, and you're like, well, that's who God is, so I'm done with God. Or the Bible told me so Jesus. No matter what you do, well, the Bible says, well, the Bible says, well, the Bible says, And you're like, well, I know, but here's what I'm learning. I know, but the Bible says, yeah, but here's what my professor says. Yeah, I know, but the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, and you're not really sure what the Bible says. It's just somebody told you what the Bible says, and that's not cutting it today either. So you've walked away from either a somebody told you so God or a Bible told you so Jesus, and you're kind of done. Now, we got into a somebody told me so God a few weeks ago, and we revealed in that message, and that's for those of you who are just kind of coming into this, we talked about how there are six uh, little G gods that a lot of people have bought into. And a lot of times when you walk away from your understanding of God, you really haven't walked away from the God of Christianity. You've walked away from a God that someone told you about, and you are finished with that God, you're done with that God. But when you walk away, you didn't really walk away from the God of Christianity because that God didn't exist anyway. I gave you six of them, okay? If you remember, I'm sure all of you remember these. You've memorized them all. I, I know this review is not even necessary for 99.9% of you, okay? But just bear with the ignorant people among you, okay? <laughs> all right? Six gods. We talked about the guardian of the galaxy God. We talked about the significant other God or the boyfriend, girlfriend God. We talked about the gap God, we talked about the anti-science God, we talked about the on-demand God. He is when you want him, you pull the string and he answers. And we talked about the shame God. And we learned that some of us didn't actually walk away from God, just a version of God. The boyfriend God, the girlfriend God, the gap God, the anti-science God. That was a great message, should have been here. Then in part three, the last time I talked, we got into the Bible tells me so Jesus. Okay? The Bible tells me so, Jesus. And that message was fun, fun. Okay? Because here's what we learned, and this is where it's going to kind of rattle some cages. We learned that some of us walked away from God because of something we read in the Bible. You flipped over to Genesis, you started reading, and you went, oh, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. You flip over here to another Old Testament book, and you read it, and you go, there is no way that's true. Or you flip over here and you read something else and someone in college or someone in the class or a biology class or science class or whatever said, hey, there's no way this is true. That's not truth. And you read it in there and you don't believe that what it said in the Bible is true. And you thought, well, if everything in the Bible is not true, every little detail, then nothing in the Bible is true. And since you came to believe that this one thing in the Bible is not true, You had to abandon it all. So you just took the whole Bible and threw it away. And because you threw away the Bible, you threw away all of Christianity. You threw away all of your faith. And what we said in that message is that Christianity doesn't exist because of the Bible. Christianity doesn't exist because of the Bible. Christianity did not take off in the first century because of a book. In fact, they didn't even have a book for the first couple of hundred years. The church exploded. The disciples went around the known world. They shared the message of Christ with people and they didn't even carry a Bible with them. So Christianity was not based upon a book. The Bible, the Christianity doesn't exist because of the Bible. The Bible exists because of Christianity. In other words, what we call the New Testament came about because of an event, the resurrection, not because of a book but because of the resurrection. 
The early followers of Jesus were not following Jesus because he said the Bible's true. Jesus did not come on the scene and say, hey, the Bible's true, the Bible's true, the Bible's true, follow me because the Bible's true. No, following Jesus, the people who followed Christ in the New Testament followed him because he came out of the tomb and he was alive. So that's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. I know some of you are scratching your hair going, I'm not really sure about this or that. So I said, go back and listen to parts one, two, and three, because we dive into that. We get into that and the importance of understanding the power of the resurrection and what's launched the New Testament church. Let me give you a quick history of Christianity, okay? I'm going to give you like a whole lot of information really condensed. And the nine o'clock, you, you guys are the most intelligent. Of the, two, of the two services, you're the most intelligent, okay? You're the sharpest, all right? Some of you are like, hey, I normally go to the 11 o'clock service. I'll tell them the same thing, okay? <laughs> you're my favorite, then I'll tell them you're my favorite, okay? So anyway. All right, here's a quick history lesson of Christianity. Here's kind of how it happened. This will, this will help you. When Jesus began teaching all through Judea, he claimed, this is extremely important, that the Jewish scriptures, what we now consider to be the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures pointed to him. When he began to teach and preach, he said that the Jewish scriptures pointed to him. And I'm telling you, when he said that, that was blasphemy. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the Sadducees, they were like, what are you talking about? You're telling us that all this prophecy, all this information, the Jewish scriptures, all of it points to you? You're the fulfillment of all of this? How could you possibly believe that you are the one that's been prophesied about for thousands of years? I mean, they were livid. But some people who were hanging around him and were paying attention to what he was teaching and watching what was going on in his ministry began to wonder if what he said might be true. Maybe he really is the Messiah. Maybe the Jewish scriptures actually does point to him. And then about three and a half years later, something happens. He's crucified. He dies. And he's placed in a tomb and he's sealed. And all the people who were following him at that time thought, well, he's another failed Messiah. We put our hopes in him. We put our dreams in him. We were hopeful that he is the one that was fulfilling the Jewish scriptures. We were hopeful he was the one that all the prophecies were turning to. And we've even given up our jobs. We've laid down our nets. We have walked away from tax collecting. We've walked away from fishing. We've walked away from all the other things. And we have rested our hopes on this man who we were hopeful and we believe might be the Messiah. And now he is crucified like a common criminal. He's drugged down from the cross. He's placed in a tomb and it is sealed now listen this is really important there were no jesus followers after the crucifixion in that three-day period when he was dead and he was put in the tomb there were people following jesus they thought it was over they thought the whole thing was over. They didn't know how to piece their lives back together again in fact if you pay attention peter and some of the other ones are going well we might as well go back to fishing this didn't work out. This didn't happen the way we thought it was going to happen. We might as well let it all go. Nobody believed in that moment he was the Son of God. Everybody doubted. Nobody had faith. In fact, the disciples decided they would just go back to what they were doing and try to pick their lives up again. And hopefully, after three and a half years of being with this guy who was claiming to be the Messiah, that maybe those who kind of oversaw the temple and oversaw the religious practices might let them come back into the temple. Because they had marginalized themselves from the religious establishment of the day. So here, this is really important. Don't think of the disciples as a group of men and women who had incredible faith. Oh man, I, I wish I had the faith of Peter. I wish I had the faith of John. Let me tell you, when Jesus was crucified, they thought the whole thing was over and they had been duped. Have you ever wondered the same thing? Have you ever looked at the entire thing and thought, man, what if I'm wrong? You ever looked at all of it and just thought, you know what, what if he's not the Son of God? What if this isn't true? And you think, oh, I can't think those thoughts. Nobody who's serious about Jesus ever has those thoughts, really. That's exactly what the disciples thought for those three days. 
They thought they had been cheated. They thought they were lied to. They thought they had been duped. They thought the whole thing was over. They might as well go back and pick up their nets, get back in the boats, go back out to fish, and try to pick up the pieces of their lives. Then an event occurred. Jesus rose from the dead, and Christianity launched. Christianity did not sputter hopefully get up here and get some altitude and we'll finally catch the wind and maybe over a period of 50, maybe 100 years or so, we'll finally get our religious word out and we'll sell some books and then people will start putting us on Facebook and then we'll get enough of that you know, mass of people out there and then we'll eventually have something to go to conferences and teach, but it's going to take 20, 30 years or so to get kind of that group, that, that momentum. No, 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 no. Christianity launched like a rocket ship into space. People started rereading. When Jesus came out of the tomb and they saw him, and we're not talking about a few people saw him, we're talking hundreds of people saw him. Eyewitnesses to the event of Jesus being alive. They touched him, they ate with him, they talked with him. He opened the Jewish scriptures to them so they could understand what we consider to be the Old Testament now, and they understood things that they had never understood before. For 40 days, he spoke with them, taught with them. They learned things, their eyes were open, their hearts were aflame. Incredible things happened within that period and Christianity took off and then when he ascended he left they went back and started rereading what we consider the Old Testament and they start saying okay okay this makes sense now now I see now I see now I see now I see how he was prophesied about now I understand how all this works now I understand the prophecies that were made of him many many years ago and then something really cool happened It slipped outside of the Jewish followers and it got into the Gentile followers. And then Gentile people from all over the known world, they began to read the Jewish scriptures too. And they realized something that the Jewish people had a very difficult time understanding. All of the Jewish scriptures pointed to Jesus. Not just a few of them, not just a select few that the Jewish people could wrap their minds around. They began to see how Jesus was all through the Old Testament. Here's a challenge for you. When you get time, not during my message, (laughs) but when you get time, go read Isaiah 53. Just go read it. Written about 700 BC. So this is about 695 years, 700 years before Christ is born. Read it and ask yourself this question. Who fits this description? Who fits this description? I think what you'll find when you're reading it going, that sounds like Jesus. That sounds like Jesus. That that, that sounds like Jesus. You'll be blown away by something written 700 years before Christ was born. How perfectly in alignment it comes to the description of who Jesus is. Now watch this. The early Christians, we're talking about Peter, James, John, all the disciples, eventually took the Jewish scriptures... Okay, And they combined the Jewish scriptures with the Christian writings, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, all the people who were writing in the New Testament, and they put them together eventually. Not Peter, James, and John. They didn't put them together. It wasn't even together at that point. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you know it took a long time. But the Christians began to eventually gather all this material, and they took the writings of James and John and Peter, etc., and they brought it together with the writings of the Jewish Scriptures, and they put them together, and they gave the Jewish Scriptures another name. They called it the Old Covenant. And then they gave the Christian writings a name. They called it the New Covenant. We now call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. But for a long time, it was referred to as the Old Covenant that God had made with man and women and the New Covenant that Christ changed everything. And this is really important. We're done with that little history lesson there, okay? Really important. And this is going to not set well with some of us, but that's good. I want us to stretch. The reason we take the Old Testament seriously, listen, 
today. The reason why we who follow Christ, we who are within the new covenant, we who live our lives within the writings and teachings of the apostles and, and Christ himself, the reason why we as followers of Jesus take the Old Testament seriously is not because the Old Testament is infallible, without error, no problems, no issues, no questions. No, 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 no. I'll tell you why we take it seriously. The whole thing points to Jesus. And Jesus took it seriously. All of it points to Christ, and he took it seriously. He said it was important. But listen, Christianity itself does not rise and fall on the Jewish scriptures. Christianity preceded what we know as the Bible. If you were with us a couple weeks ago, you realized that the New Testament church had exploded and there were tens of thousands of followers of Christ and they were spread all over the known world before the Bible even came together. In fact, many of the people who followed Christ had never even read the book of Romans. I hear people today, you can't even be a Christian if you don't understand the details of Romans. Really? Well, there were hundreds, tens of thousands of people who followed Jesus and incredible things and never even read the book of Romans. There were people who followed Christ for a number of years, gave their entire life to him, and eventually were martyred and had never read half of what we now consider to be the New Testament. Christianity preceded what we now know as the Bible. It was, Christianity was already up and running many years before the Bible was. And the Bible didn't cause Christianity. So if you walked away, listen, listen. If you walked away from Christianity because of something you read in the Bible and you just couldn't wrap your mind around it and it didn't make sense and you thought, well, since it doesn't make sense here in Genesis or because it doesn't make sense here in Leviticus or because it doesn't make sense here in Isaiah, I guess I got to throw the entire thing away because you can't be a Christian unless you understand and believe every little detail of everything you've ever been told about the Bible. If that's the way you view it, I'm telling you, you have walked away unnecessarily. And I'll say it again, the reason Christians take the Old Testament seriously is not because it makes sense to everybody and you understand all of it, not even because you agree with everything, but because it points to Jesus and the reason we take it seriously is because Jesus took it seriously. Scott, why does that matter that Jesus took it seriously? Because when someone predicts his or her own death and resurrection and they pull it off, I say we listen to them. You know what I'm saying? So if somebody says, listen, I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back. They're going to take me and they're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me and I'm going to be dead. But I'm going to come back. I'm going to bring myself back. And they do it. I say we sit down and pay attention. So if Jesus took it seriously, I say we take it seriously. If Jesus read it, I say we read it. If Jesus memorized it, I say we memorize it. If Jesus understood it and did his best to understand and teach it, I say we do it. Well, do I have to understand it all? No. Do I have to agree with it all? No. Do I have to, uh, does it all have to line up with this and this and this? It's, it's all or nothing? No, it's not. There were so many Christians who followed Christ for years and years and years who did, I guarantee you, if you went to many of them who couldn't even read or write. And try to explain some of the details and said, do you believe this? They would go, I don't know. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. I was going the wrong direction, met Christ, he turned my life around. Well, do you understand what it means here we're here in Genesis? I haven't even read Genesis. <laughs> well, you got to read Genesis before you follow Christ. Where does it say that? Many of the people had never read it before. Was you telling me we shouldn't read it? No, 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 read it. Jesus took it seriously. He read it. He memorized it. He taught it. Read it. Understand it. Do the best you can. Grow. I hope by the time that you're 20 years into following Christ, you've read it over and over and over and take it seriously and understand it and study it and read books on it and on and on. Absolutely. But don't let a scripture, a verse, a concept, a teaching trip you up and you throw all of it out 
because of one thing or two things you don't understand or get. You walked away unnecessarily. Listen, this is so important. You start, Scott, you say that every five minutes because every single thing I say is important. <laughs> and I get excited, all right? People who didn't understand the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, who didn't even agree with the Old Testament, follow Jesus after the resurrection because of the resurrection. That is so important. People follow Jesus after the resurrection because of the resurrection. I assure you, when he came out of the tomb and he was like, follow me, and they were like, can I follow you? Jesus didn't go, well, I do have a test. I want to see how much of the Old Testament you believe. So I'm going to give you a test, and you need to work your way through this, and if you can agree with these 25 statements, if you can agree with these teachings, then and only then can you follow me. No, no, no. The evidence of his resurrection was overwhelming. They saw him. They touched him. There was nothing religious about their faith at that time. It was based on an event they couldn't deny. Jesus came out of the tomb. He was alive. They were following him. We'll worry about the details later. We'll open up some things later you can ask some questions later but right now that man said he was God he predicted his death he came back from the dead I'm with him I'm following him the resurrection launched Christianity not the Bible Christianity was launched because of the resurrection in fact a person could have never opened the Old Testament never even known there was an Old Testament and it would not have affected the person becoming a Christian because their following of Jesus was based on the resurrection, not a book. Listen, Christianity didn't begin with people who believed something. It began with people who saw something. That's key. Because some of you wrestle with belief, you wrestle with belief, you wrestle with belief. And you think the church says this, just believe it. Yeah, but I got questions. Don't question, just believe it. Yeah, but I got a question. Don't, don't question, just believe it. Folks, that is not Christianity. Christianity wasn't even built on that. Christianity wasn't built. It didn't begin. It didn't get launched with people who believed something because somebody else told them. It was launched because they saw something. They saw a man come back from the dead. It's why we constantly talk about resurrection around here. It's why we sing songs. I don't even know the names of them, but they're about resurrection. <laughs> It's why we turn the volume up. Why? Because the whole thing rests on the one who came back from the dead. You became a Christian through faith, not because of faith. What do you mean? It's not believe, 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 believe because we said so. No, no, no. There is overwhelming evidence that Jesus died and rose again. You can rest on that. And this is key. The disciples were not great people of faith, as I said earlier. We think that. We're mistaken. Look at the difference between the disciples and you, okay? Let's take Peter, for example, all right? He saw Jesus rise from the dead. Anybody in here? You were there the day Jesus came out of the tomb? Some of you I know are somewhat old enough to have maybe, <laughs> if you weren't there, at least your parents were there, but... I don't think anybody's here who's there. They touched him. Peter touched him. Peter ate with him. Peter talked with him. Let me ask you a question. How much faith does that take? How much faith does it take when you actually sit down with the resurrected Christ and reach over and touch him? How much faith does it take when you pull up to the shore and Jesus is cooking breakfast and you sit down and eat with him? How much faith does it take when you look at him and you can see the wounds, you can see the scars? In fact, who was it? Thomas was the one who said, I, I'm not going to believe unless I see. I am not going to believe unless I see. That's not a great man of faith. If somebody was sitting in this room and said, I ain't believing any of this stuff unless I see it, what would we say? That's a skeptic. That's a doubter. 
That's somebody who won't trust. That's somebody who won't believe. That was Thomas. That was the, the whole church was launched on people who didn't believe. There's hope for you. Isn't that great? There's hope for you. The whole thing was launched on people who were skeptical, people who said, we might as well go back to work, people who said, well, we forget this, people who thought they had been duped and lied to. The whole thing rested on them. Man, if you had a product that you wanted to get around the world, some of you business owners, and the people who work for you didn't even believe in the product, and you leave and say, well, you guys got to take it and sell it around the world. What hope do you have? That was those disciples until the resurrection happened. In fact, Jesus' own brother didn't even believe he was the Messiah until he came back from the dead. Say, that's just, that's, that's just hard for me to imagine that his own brother didn't even believe him. Well, let me ask you, how many of you got brothers? How many of your brothers are close to being God? <laughs> oh. What would it take to convince you that your brother is the son of God? <laughs> He'd have to come back from the dead. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and that's what happened. They didn't have this great amount of faith. It rested on what they saw, not just what they believed. In fact, you and I have more faith than many of the disciples had. They handled him, they talked with him, they ate with him, not us. Okay. All right, that was my introduction. <laughs> That's where we've been, all right? <laughs> I'm, I'm more than halfway through. Some of you are like, okay, what does that mean? I'll never get there to brunch. All right. I said all that to get to this part right here. Through everything, what Jesus said about himself turned out to be true. Right? He said, I'm going to do this, and he did it. He said, I'm going to do this, and he did it. All the prophecies and everything lined up. He became the fulfillment. He was the fulfillment. His resurrection proved it. He was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He was dead. He is alive. Everything he said about himself he predicted his own death. He predicted his own resurrection. All the Jewish scriptures pointed to him. He fulfilled prophecy. On and on it goes. So, if that's all true, and it is, then what Jesus said about God can be trusted. Now, why is that important? Because the concept that a lot of people had about God was wrong. And when Jesus came on the scene, he turned and flipped the concept of who God is upside down. And if every single thing Jesus predicted he fulfilled, therefore he can be trusted, then what he said about the nature and the character of God himself can be trusted. Follow me? The gospel writers documented what Jesus said about God. So, those of you here, those watching... When you are reconsidering God, if you're here and you're just like walking through this series because you are just reconsidering God, you're like, I don't know, I, I gave up on God years ago, I, you know, I, I'm not so sure. If you're reconsidering God, okay, the place to begin is Jesus. What did he say about God? Not, not, not what did so-and-so when you were a kid say about God. Not did what, what did my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother say about God. Not, not, not what did Jesus say about God. And in those early, well-attestable documents that we talked about a few weeks ago, how it was early writings, eyewitnesses, Jesus says several things about God. And John documented these statements. He wrote them down. Now, who's John? John is an eyewitness who believed Jesus, then disbelieved Jesus, then wasn't sure what he believed about Jesus. Then the resurrection happened, and he experienced all that he experienced in those 40 days with Jesus, and eventually everything crystallized, 
and he firmly believed that Jesus was who he said he was and God had become human in the person of Jesus. Then John was exiled by Emperor Domitian to the island of Patmos. He was taken, arrested, he was taken to an island and he was dropped off. And he had a long time to think about what he believed. And it was on that island that he began to write down all the things that Christ had taught him and what he knew that he knew that he knew he believed and understood now and things began to open up in his mind and he began to see things for the first time. Now, why was he banished? Because a lot of other Christian leaders were killed. Why was John banished? John was one of the oldest disciples, the last disciple actually to live. He outlived the rest of the disciples. He was banished to keep him from becoming another Christian martyr. Because every time during the Christian explosion and the church began to grow every time they killed a christian leader another thousand christians begin people begin to follow christ so you get the statement that the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church every time they killed one a thousand other people would rise up they'd kill another one a thousand new people would rise up and begin to follow christ so you kill one you got a thousand you kill another you got now you got two thousand you kill another you got three or four thousand now so they said we got to stop this because the church keeps growing so they took him and they put him on an island and banished him from society. He would just die there. And here's what's interesting. John spent three and a half years with Jesus. He watched Jesus after his resurrection. He spent 40 days with him. He began to read the old, the Jewish scriptures again in light of the resurrection of Christ. He began to see things completely different than he ever saw them before. He began to flip everything around. He began to understand God differently. You just imagine the overhaul John goes through, okay? Now he is on an island, banished from society, and he is beginning to put down his thoughts. Everything he understood Everything he believed, everything he knew was truth. And here's what's absolutely amazing to me. John takes all of it and reduces God to one word. One word. Remember, he has seen Jesus face to face. He has touched him, listened to him, asked him a hundred questions. If you were with Jesus, how many questions did you ask him? I got a question, I got a question, I got a question. I got a... He asked him a hundred questions, and he received a hundred answers. And John reduces everything he knew about God through Jesus to one word. Love. Love. He's rotting away on an island. And he says, you want to know who God is? God's love. Let me ask you a question. How could God be a God of love? Ask John. He spent years with him. How could God be a God of love when he's been banished to an island to rot and die? How can God be a God of love? Ask John. He saw his resurrected body. He touched him. He ate with him. He talked with him. How, 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 how can we see God as love when all those Christians were martyred and killed and sold into slavery and put into the, the arenas for the lions to come out and eat them alive? How in the world can God be a God of love? I don't know, ask someone who lived it. What in the world did John witness that allowed him to draw that conclusion? You don't want to know why I study John? Because you got to, you're a Christian. No! Because someone told you you got to read two chapters a day. No! Because it's in your yearly Bible. No! Because you feel guilty coming into church and lifting your hands when you know you hadn't read the Bible. Oh, God, help us. That is childish faith. It's time to grow up. You want to know why I study John? Because I want to know what he knows about Jesus. I want to know how does a man live his entire life and eventually be stuck on an island and die an old man, banished from society, how in the world does he see God as love? I want to know that. Because there's things about Jesus that John reveals, and Jesus reveals things about God. I want to know that. I study not because I have to. I study not because I got to. I study because I feel guilty if I don't. I study because I want to. I want to understand what that's about. 
Here's what John wrote about Jesus. John 14, 7 through 11. Here's Jesus talking to John, talking to his disciples. He says this, if you really know me, if you really know me, John, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, just like many of us would say, I'm so confused. It's basically what Philip says. Lord, uh, show us the Father and, and, and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus says back to Philip, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Philip, listen to me. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the... If you can't believe based on what I've said, then believe based on what you've seen. Philip, I know this is hard for you. John, I know it's hard for you. I know it's difficult for you to imagine that God has humanized himself, that God has personified himself in me. But he has. And if you have a hard time believing that, then at least believe based on the evidence of the works themselves. You see, God is like Jesus. When you see Jesus, you're seeing God. There is no difference. So what did Jesus, who is God, say about himself? Not did what so-and-so say. Not that, not, not that what well, somebody told me. No, no, no. What did Jesus, who is God, say about himself? Let me give you three thoughts. These are quick. These are quick. These are quick. So each one's going to be 15 minutes. I know you. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's going to be quick. It's going to be quick. Number one, God is spirit. John 4, 24, God is spirit. Say, so where'd you get it? <laughs> God is spirit. It's right there. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit is impersonal. Jesus came to make God personal. So God is spirit. And then Jesus has come to make that spirit personal so that you can touch, feel, hug, experience, watch, talk, learn from God. And this is an amazing statement from 2,000 years ago because the Jewish people who were listening to this for the very first time, they believed God was spaceless, timeless, immaterial. That's what they were taught in the Jewish scriptures. That's why they were forbidden to make any kind of material idol. Don't make a graven image. Don't, don't put me into some kind of image like an animal or some kind of statue. That was at the very beginning of the entire thing. Do not make a graven image. You know why? Because God is immaterial. He is spaceless. He is timeless. And he was not going to be contained in any kind of... And listen, that was radically different than all the other people in that time because they had idols everywhere. In fact, if you moved, you picked up all your idols and you went to your next house and you set all your idols on the shelves and all their gods were just moved around. And if you go back and study the Jewish scriptures, you'll see how all the people of Israel often went, we want idols like all the other nations. We want to move our God around. We want to put our God on a shelf, you know, elf on a shelf kind of thing, you know. We want to have this idol here and this idol there. We want to touch and feel. And God was like, no, 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 I am not like that. I'm spirit. Do not put me in an idol. The Jewish scriptures revealed God who said, no, do not put me into any kind of material. That was a difficult concept for the people and the nations around the world to understand. But here's what's amazing to me, okay? Let me go deep and we'll come back up. Referring to God as spirit is exactly what us modern people would expect. We kind of have a different concept of spirit and immaterial because now we understand things are real even though you can't see or touch them. We understand the whole Big Bang theory that 
you know, that they didn't understand at that time, how everything started from singularity and all matter, space, and time erupted into this instant. There was immaterial before there was material. They could not understand that at that time. And this is huge. Huge, 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 huge. I'm going to throw this out, and then we won't have time to explore it, and you'll walk out going, man, I wish we could talk about that more. <laughs> everything that began to exist had a cause for its existence. And that first cause had to be outside of space-time and matter. Space-time and matter cannot create all space-time and matter. So the first cause had to be spaceless, timeless, and material for us to have space-time and material. You have to have something spaceless to create space. You have to have something timeless to create time. You have to have something immaterial to create material. Material can't create material because if material creates material, then you've got to go back and figure out where the first material came from. So eventually you got to go back until you find immaterial, creating material, timelessness, creating time, spacelessness, creating space. So if you take it all the way back, you find a spaceless, timeless, immaterial reality, and that's exactly who God responds, expresses himself to be. I'm spirit. Spaceless, timeless, immaterial. But that's hard to wrap our minds around all of that. And you know what? Here's what's amazing. God loves us so much, he knew that would be hard for us too. So Jesus not only told us that God is spirit, but he came back and said, not only is God spirit, but God is Father. Now you're starting to take this concept of spirituality and you're starting to put it now into something you can wrap your mind around, and that is a father. Luke 11:2, 2, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. Wow, that was radical for them radical for them because God was always the God on the mountain right it was he was always the God up there on the fire and we were down here and he rumbled you know in fact they heard thunder and saw lightning and they thought "Ooh, you know as I said a few weeks ago God must be you know fighting with angels or something and bowling or whatever you know <laughs> silly stuff Jesus comes and says God is spirit yes he is he is timeless spaceless and he is immaterial but he is father John, that's the best I can do for you when John pins this. It's the best I can do for God is spirit, but he is father. It's the best relational picture I can draw for you. And after the resurrection, after the resurrection, after the resurrection, John begins to reflect on all Jesus said about God. And John wants to reveal what he knows about God through Jesus. So he says not only is God spirit, not only is God father, but God is love. He is bringing it down, down, down. 1 John 4, 16, God is love. And this is amazing coming from John. You know why? Keep your mind engaged for just a moment. We're going to go. Listen, John grew up as a Jewish man, right? What's the big deal about that? He was taught that God loves Jewish people first. <laughs> Let's not go there. And he puts up with everyone else. Jewish people of the first century would never go into the home of a Gentile. You know why they would never go into the home of a Gentile? Because if they went into the home of a Gentile, it would ceremonially make them unclean. And they would never, ever, ever invite Gentiles over to their home for dinner because if they ever invited Gentiles over to their home for dinner, their entire house would be unclean. But John was so radically changed that the best way he knew to describe God was that God was love. And I guess the absolute crystallized center of all that John writes is the verse we know so well. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Something happened inside of John. And again, we modern people get that better than probably any other generation. When you hear people say, even skeptics say, well, you know, if there's a God, he's got to be a loving God. Or I believe in a loving God. That's a Christian idea. <laughs> they didn't believe in loving gods until Jesus. Jesus introduced a loving God. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Wow. All right. We're going to wrap it up today by a concept. We're going to go. Would you agree with this? Shade requires sun. Right? You can't, you, you, you can't step into the shade if there is no sun, no light. So would you say 
Uh, let's go over here in the shade. What are you assuming? There is a sun. There is light to cast shade. As shade requires sun, evil requires good. The sun precedes shade. Good precedes evil. Love precedes unlove. We shouldn't be surprised to learn that God is love. You know that in your heart. You know that down deep inside. There's got to be a loving God. Why? Because we got to have justice in this world. we got to have fairness in this world. We've got to have something set right. There's right, there's wrong, there's good, there's evil, there's light, there's darkness. Down in your heart, God has written that law there. It's in your conscience, it's in your mind. When you appeal to ought and justice and love, you declare the essence and the existence of God because you can't have shade without the sun. Watch kids. Just watch kids. Don't even take them to church. Don't, I'm, I'm, not, in, I'm not encouraging that. I'm saying, if, hypothetically speaking, you don't even take a child to church. He, he or she never goes, watch them play. Hey, give me that. That's mine. That's not fair. She can't do that to me. That's not right. Who indoctrinated them? God wrote it on their heart. They know that there's a fairness, there's a rightness, there's a wrongness, there's an oughtness. They know, they know, they know. They're just seeking for the answer to all that. How does that fit? Where does it work? It all comes down to Jesus. God is spirit, God is father, God is love. So here's my... Evan gave you last week an assignment. I'm going to give you one too. All right? I want you to uh, read, just read the Gospel of John. The whole thing? Yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> oh, man, it'll take me forever. No, it won't. Just read the Gospel of John and ask this question. Ask this question. What do I learn about the Father from the Son? Just read it, just read it, just read it. And maybe right before you begin to read it, just say, Father, teach me about you through what you taught John. Show me who you are through this writing. Open my heart, open my mind, open my soul up. Teach me who you are. And you'll see God is spirit. God is Father. God is love. All right, let's pray. Father, what an amazing, amazing, amazing God you are. How incredibly powerful, loving, gracious, kind, compassionate. Father, I know that we struggle, we ask questions, we have mysteries we're not sure about. But Father, may we not trip up on those things. Father, we want to follow you because we might not know a lot of things about this and that. And we might have differences of opinion when it comes to politics and differences of opinion when it comes to how we go about this or that in the world. We may have differences of opinion from this scripture in this book and this scripture over here in this book. And we might see things differently when it comes to prayer or worship or whatever. But God, may we all stand firmly upon the resurrection of your son Jesus and know that we know that we know that you are spirit, but you are not just spirit. You are father. You're not just a father. You're a loving father. Father, may we meet you there, open our minds to truth, and may that truth set us free. We honor and worship you in the name of the one who makes it all possible, the one who holds it all together. Jesus, we pray. Amen.